Excellent. Thank you, Christina, for the, the lovely introduction. For uh, Thank you to everyone for joining. Um, I, I've been a fan of the, the series for a long time, so it's a, an honor to be able to, for me to join as a participant rather than an audience member. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking today a little bit about the Human Microbiome Bioactors resource, strain specificity, and my title lied a little bit. I changed my mind and won't, won't speak directly to gene function prediction, but we'll have some other things in there instead. Um, so I probably don't need a lot of microbiome introduction for, for this audience. Um, as, as Christina mentioned, uh, my group works on a combination of methods development for studying microbial communities generally, and uh, mostly population health applications in the, the human microbiome. Um, the Human Microbiome Bioactors Resource, or HMBR, is a platform that we've worked on for several years now that combines both of these aspects. Um, and it's been an NIDDK-funded collaboration between our group, Wendy Garrett, um, next door at the School of Health, uh, Public Health, Owen White and Anu Marikar at the University of Maryland, and, and Ron Xavier across Boston at the, the Broad. So the goal of the HMBR is broadly to facilitate discovery of microbiome bioactives, um, where we, we take a pretty broad view of bioactivity as any element of the microbiome that can uh, induce or be strongly associated with a phenotype. Um, the three main categories that we've broken this, this down into include, of course, whole microbes, so bugs that when present in the, the microbiome um, induce or associate strongly with a phenotype, but then also direct mechanisms of microbial protein production. So can we identify bioactive microbial proteins that induce a phenotype or indirect mechanisms such as microbial small molecule chemistry? So are there chemical activities from particular components in the microbiome that induce a phenotype via small molecule mediation? So the HMBR broadly spans a, a wide range of resources and results from this, this general area of bioactivity discovery. We have a, a focus on the gut microbiome in GI inflammation, as supported by the NIDDK here in the, the States. But the HMBR in, includes platforms for, uh, protocols for, excuse me, collecting um, different types of gut microbiome samples. Um, so we've developed standardized sampling protocols, kits. If you have a need to collect thousands of stool samples, um, let us know and we can, we can help with that. <laughs> um, and then also generating multi-omic data from them. Um, so we focus a lot on getting not just sequencing data, but other types of functional data, such as transcriptomics or metabolomics to help inform what these microbial community samples are doing. Um, we've developed a data resource at the HMBR that includes essentially all of the inflammatory bowel disease, shotgun metagenomes, and some other multiomics that we could get our hands on. We've processed all of those data sets in a standardized way, make them available online, um, along with curated metadata. Um, and we've developed uh, computational methods for meta-analyzing um, data resources like this in, in IBD and, and otherwise. The part that my group focused on especially is here in the middle, um, which I'll, I'll talk about today, computational prioritization of these three different types of potential bioactive elements. Um, and then to oversimplify, um, Romnick has, has worked on protocols for um, validating molecular hypotheses in vitro regarding microbiome bioactives. Wendy has done similar work for mouse models in vivo. And then Owen and Anoop's teams have made all of this available online through a web portal, which you're welcome to check out at the, the URL down here at the bottom. So again, I'll, I'll focus mainly on these computational prioritization methods that we've built to figure out which elements of microbial communities might be bioactive in the first place. Some of these, especially for things like microbial gene products, have already been published, so I, I won't focus on them as much today. But I do want to tell a few stories about small molecule chemistry and prioritizing and characterizing ways in which microbial chemistry can be bioactive in the gut. Um, the first part of this work is by a, a research scientist here, Emersha Bosley, who wanted to address the sort of dramatic undercharacterization of uh, microbially associated small molecules in the gut metabolome. 
So many of us are probably familiar with the degree to which microbial proteins are undercharacterized in most microbial communities. Even in the, the well-studied human gut, two-thirds to three-quarters of microbial proteins don't have good um, molecular characterization. The situation is even more dire with respect to the metabolome. This is an example of about 550 metabolomes from the Human Microbiome Project's second phase, um, which looked at multiomics for the gut microbiome in inflammatory bowel disease. Out of an initial 80,000 or so unique chemical features, only about 600 of them are well annotated. Um, there are another 50% or so that we can at least make a guess about via mass match, but those guesses are very often wrong. And the remainder of these thousands of chemical features remain unidentified. Um, so this raised the question of whether we can use techniques from things like protein function prediction to get a, a better handle on what some of these microbiome associated chemicals might be and how they might be health associated. And a lot of work in this area has relied on this concept of guilt by association. If you have a protein that does something similar to, or uh, uh, excuse me, has similar data to um, a known characterized protein, it probably does something similar to that protein. This principle has been applied to metabolomics before using things like spectral similarity. Um, so one example is the GNPS platform which essentially correlates the similarities of double mass spec spectrum uh, spectra. So that if you have a fragmentation pattern in a chemical that looks like the fragmentation pattern of some other known chemical, then those two are probably related to each other. Unfortunately, we don't always have double mass spec. Um, so we wanted to ask the question of whether other types of guilt by association might be equally informative such as co-variation in abundances between chemicals across different microbial communities. So the, the hypothesis here is that potentially bioactive metabolites would co-vary both with phenotypes of interest and with other better characterized chemicals, helping to identify what they were. So Amrisha implemented this in a, a platform called MACARON, which stands for that complicated uh, acronym. But more intuitively, what it does is use guilt by association to prioritize um, metabolite features of interest from microbial communities and make guesses about what they might be. Um, this boils down to building co-abundance modules and then annotating elements in those modules. And I'll, I can show you what that looks like using these example data from the Human Microbiome Project. So if we start with those same 550 um, stool metabolomes, these span a collection of control individuals, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis patients, which are the two major inflammatory bowel disease subtypes. After an initial very late quality control step, we start with about 45,000 chemical features that are retained after quality control, and only 460 or so of these are, are identified or annotated. When Macron clusters these features into modules, we end up with most of them joining one of, a, 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 excuse me, at least one of 600 modules. And of these 600 or so total modules, a subset of 150 contained at least one of these annotated metabolites. Those 150 modules themselves spanned not quite 14,000 total chemical features, which gives us the opportunity to transfer information from the annotated metabolites in these modules to the unannotated ones. So Macron does that uh, by integrating a few different evidence types in addition to covariation. One is uh, changes in mass relative to an anchor compound. So each uh, module has at least one anchor. If you are slightly heavier or slightly lighter than that anchor, you are probably some biotransformation adding um, a hydroxy group, adding a ketone group, and so on, adding a methyl group or losing a methyl group, and so on and so on, relative to the, the anchor compound. We also look for epidemiological or phenotypic relevance, so whether compounds are differentially abundant with respect to a phenotype, and ecological relevance, or things like the prevalence and, and abundance and distribution of chemicals across uh, multiple microbial communities. So these properties together give us an integrated prioritization of potential bioactives, along with some initial guesses that help to in inform what some of the, the unannotated compounds might be. 
When we do this in the Human Microbiome Project for inflammatory bowel disease, um, of those uh, several hundred modules, most of them are either uniquely Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis enriched or depleted. Um, so there's a lot of both phenotypic consistency in these modules, chemical consistency in the anchor compounds that are associated with them. There are a couple of classes like fatty acids, especially short chain fatty acids that appear across uh, depleted, especially across many different modules. But if you look closely, one thing that's really striking when we compare the abundance of uncharacterized compounds to their anchor or identified compound, it's often much greater, sometimes a lot greater. So we're identifying um, uncharacterized compounds that are as much or more phenotype associated, inflammation associated as known compounds like short chain fatty acids, and sometimes much, much more abundance suggesting their importance in the phenotype. If we zoom into some of these IBD associated modules, there's a subset um, that contain compounds that have been previously inflammation associated. So each row in this visualization is a breakout of a single module, looking at the top hits of prioritized compounds within that module. And these show things like carnitines, for example, bile acid derivatives, short chain fatty acids, or hiperate, um, all of which have been IBD associated in previous studies along with these small dots, which are unannotated compounds that may be chemically related. Um, what was even more interesting than these new uh, compounds prioritized in known classes are a handful of newly prioritized chemical classes in IBD. So this included things like the um, urobilin pathway derivatives, um, histidine pathway derivatives, and some B vitamin derivatives which if we zoom into this um, module number 287 here, was one of the, the uh, specific cases that we looked into in some detail. So if you now really crack open that one module and look at the abundances of its individual members across our different phenotypes, you'll see that kind of unusually, this module is um, depleted during IBD and especially in ulcerative colitis, which is rare. Usually Crohn's disease is a, a more extreme phenotype. There are a handful of either um, standard compounds or compounds for which we could guess at a mass match that all indicated um, this pentosthenate uh, B vitamin pathway membership. But we ultimately think this actually has more to do with NAD metabolism than uh, vitamin metabolism. Since many of these compounds feeds specifically into the microbial NAD salvage pathway, as opposed to, which is sort of a counterbalance to host-based amino acid NAD production pathways. Um, so we were able to validate this for one of the compounds for which we had a, a new guess as to its identity, nicotinamide riboside. This was the most prioritized uh, in the module as depleted in ulcerative colitis and thus potentially anti-inflammatory. And this proved to be the case. Um, so Senna Bay, a, a shared postdoc with Wendy Garrett's lab, did a series of really nice mouse experiments, um, some of which built on a DSS model of, of colon injury, um, either chronically or as, excuse me, acutely, or as you'll see in a, a, a slide or two, acutely. Um, many of the, the endpoints of which suggested that or supported that indeed nicotinamide riboside acts as a, an anti-inflammatory compound in the, the gut. So out of several different endpoints, the one shown here is a histologic colitis score in which DSS treated mice exposed to, to nicotinamide riboside had overall better histological uh, outcomes, um, either in this, this chronic, excuse me, either in this acute model or in a chronic model of, of DSS exposure. So this is at least one case in which one of our prioritized compounds was correctly identified by the prioritization and experimentally validated in a, a really nice um, in vivo model system. Um, if I transition to an, another chemical story um, that I, I particularly like, um, we had similar success in identifying the microbial proteins associated with um, a phenotype relevant chemistry, in this case, drug chemistry in inflammatory bowel disease. And this was a project that Raj worked on with Amrisha and, and others in collaboration with Andy Chan and Emily Balsica's groups. 
um, where Raj wanted to identify not just which compounds are important in a phenotype, but how microbes were metabolizing them. And this is because 5-ASA has, has long been one of the first line drugs for IBD treatment. Um, up to about 80% of patients receive it initially, but in about half of those recipients, it'll pretty quickly fail and, and the, the um, patient will need to be transferred, uh, transitioned to a, a more extreme treatment like uh, steroids. So Raj was also working from the HMP2 inflammatory bowel disease data in which we had um, of the 130 or so participants, um, 45 5-ASA users with, with sufficient data for the analysis, 34 non-users, and actually 13 of these users were newly prescribed 5-ASA during the time courses when we were following them. So this provided a, a really nice baseline to see what microbial bioactivity changed before and after or during and outside of 5-ASA use. So um, both thanks to self-reporting and the metabolomics in, in these data, it was quite easy to identify um, the uh, metabolites associated with 5-ASA use. So as a drug compound, it's quite unique. In individuals not using 5-ASA, it's absent. In individuals um, receiving the 5-ASA medication, it's quite detectable. What was a little more surprising is that in the metabolomics profiles more broadly, there's actually a, a pretty wide remodeling of the um, gut metabolome during 5-ASA use for reasons we don't entirely understand still. Lots of apparently unrelated compounds change, and we don't know if this is a bug effect or a host effect or both. However, a small subset of compounds are definitely those known to be the inactivation products of 5-ASA. So it's been known since about the 80s that the main inactivation product of 5-ASA is this N-acetylated form and some other less abundant um, acylated forms. So this is known to be inactivated. It's known to be microbial, uh, microbially generated, but it hasn't been clear how 5-ASA is being acylated or acetylated into this inactive form. So knowing this, Raj asked a few questions of the data in order to identify microbial genes that might be responsible. Um, if you just do the simple thing and look for acetyltransferases via homology, you get thousands and thousands of candidates. Um, this is too broad of a, a functional category to identify just the genes responsible for this transformation. However, Raj used two really multi-omic criteria that ended up working really well. Um, one looked at differential metatranscriptomic expression relative to a metagenomic baseline during 5-ASA use, so contrasting users to non-users, and then a similar test of differential metatranscriptomic expression specifically during the presence of high N-acetyl 5-ASA, the inactivated form. So combining all three of the different data types and looking for genes that are turned on, transcripts that are turned on, when there's a lot of inactivated product. This first criterion turned up five uh, significant hits. The second criterion turned up seven that, that reached statistical significance. These turned out to be non-overlapping. So we had 12 candidates overall. And again, just to, to uh, indicate that you can't really do this by sequence analysis alone, even if we look at the one uh, known enzyme that, that's able to, to make this transformation, a salmonella N-acetyltransferase, there are about 5,000 potential candidates that have even remote homology to this gene, but none of them occurred in the, the gut microbiome. So we really focused on these um, 12 candidates, which turned out to occur in two different sequence families, um, one of which was predominantly Bacteroide, uh, Bacteroidetes carried, with one really interesting probable horizontal transfer uh, exception and one that was particularly tightly conserved mainly among uh, Firmicutes members. So Raj went on to experimentally validate both of these again. We're looking specifically at the Firmicutes example here, but he's done the same experiments for the Bacteroidetes gene family. Um, when expressed either heterologously or in a, a cell-free system, uh, the enzyme is able to convert 5-ASA to the inactivated N-acetyl uh, form only when the 5-ASA substrate and an acetyl-CoA cofactor and the enzyme are present. Um, so we got a similar result again, both for one of the Firmicutes family members and for one of the, the Bacteroidetes family members. Finally, what was really nice translationally about this story 
is that when Raj went back, either in the, the HMP2 or in an independent validation cohort, and said, okay, now that we have this hypothesis about genes that might be responsible for 5-ASA inactivation, do they matter clinically? It turned out that carriage of any of these genes, and actually in a, I don't show it here, but in a dose-dependent way, carriage of multiple uh, of these genes does actually increase the relative risk of progression from 5-ASA use to steroid use. Um, so this was again a, a really fortunate story. I like I like showing uh, this example because it just happened to work really well. And Raj did a great job, and and many thanks to to Jared and Emily's lab who helped with uh, the experiments. Here we were able to go again from a big multiomic data set, take advantage of several different types of multiomic measurements to drill down to a very specific set of protein families and chemical activity that does have compelling clinical relevance. So it doesn't always work that well, but in, in this case it did. Um, in the last 10 minutes, I do wanna come back to part of my title that I haven't spoken to yet, which is um, things that we can do now with microbial strain genomics. Um, and I, I didn't, again, I didn't really get to gene function prediction. It was more chemical function prediction today. Um, but we've done a lot of work recently with strain specificity of either gene function prediction or um, uh, chemical activity, thanks to a, a system that a, a former postdoc in the lab put together, Andrew Ghazi, that really exposes strain level epidemiology in a, a way that, that we didn't have access to before. So this platform called Anpan, just to, to very briefly summarize the methodology, helps to identify strain specific features of microbial community members that are phenotypically relevant. Um, it works from shotgun metagenomes after quality control and pairing taxonomic profiles of which bugs are there with functional profiles of their gene specificity. It starts with a, a first step that just identifies samples that are appropriate for strain analysis um, because not every sample has enough sequencing depth and, and enough coverage of every bug to even support confident strain calling, and it does this via pan-genome analysis. But then Anpan enables three different types of questions with respect to, to strain uh, features. One is identifying strain-specific gene carriage that is associated with a phenotype inter of interest. So genes that are gained or lost in strains of a bug that may not itself be differentially abundant, but the gene carriage is uh, specific to a phenotype of interest. The second analysis does the same kind of thing, but for genetic variation or phylogeny. So overall genome structure rather than specific gene carriage that is phenotype associated. And the third is kind of intermediate and looks at strain specific pathway abundance. So pathways that are preferentially retained or lost in strains associated with a, a particular phenotype. So we've used ANPON successfully in uh, colorectal cancer microbiome analysis and rheumatoid arthritis analysis, but I wanted to show a, a fun uh, example today that um, represents a collaboration that we've had for several years now with um, Hills Pet Nutrition, um, which is a fantastic platform for studying nutrition in the, the microbiome generally. Um, it's really hard to get people to tell you what they eat, um, but Hills, as a, a pet food company, knows exactly what their, their research animals eat every day of their, their lives. Um, so we've used this both to study nutrition in the microbiome and some one health aspects of how human microbiomes interact with companion animal microbiomes. A lot of this relies on data from this fantastic um, research facility that, that Hills maintains with several hundred um, dogs and, and cats in which again, both microbiome samples, multiomic data from them and incredibly detailed nutrition and physiology information uh, can be collected. Um, so for one of the, the studies with uh, the Hills team that I can talk about today, we've been comparing a subset of about 2000 shotgun metagenomes from Hills uh, facility, uh, cats and dogs another 500 or so shotgun metagenomes from public companion animal data sets, both cats and dogs, and then using um, a human microbiome project data as a human reference to compare both composition and strain carriage between uh, different host species. 
Um, if we take a, uh, start with a high level look at which microbes generally or what the structure of these different host microbiomes are, we get a result that's been seen before in, in previous studies where humans in blue, uh, cats in red and dogs in yellow do tend to have strikingly different gut microbiomes, even between the, the canine and feline companion animals. You'll sometimes see this outgroup in darker blue, which is a Malagasy population. Um, so more of a developing microbiome um, as opposed to the human microbiome projects, more westernized microbiome as a, a comparator here. When we start drilling in a little bit though, to, to move past these high level views that have been seen before, we can very easily identify um, a lot of new, newly observed microbes that are either shared across all hosts, often with some host specificity. So all of these bugs, for example, like the, the previous B. vulgatus is humans uh, preferential, but still carried by cats and dogs. Um, something like uh, Prevotella copri, which is of particular interest to this group, is similarly carried by, by all three hosts. Um, this particular bifidobacterium is preferentially carried by cats and so on and so on. Um, unsurprisingly, there are even more uh, microbes that are either companion animal uh, generally, uh, carried generally by companion animals or host unique, either in cats, dogs, or, or excuse me, humans, cats, or dogs. Um, however, this gets a lot more interesting when we really zoom in and ask about the specific strains of these microbes that are carried. Because just knowing, say, that we uh, might sh uh, share Prevotella copri with our cat or with our dog doesn't mean that it's the same Prevotella copri. So when we really ask how many strains of these bugs are actually the ones being shared between hosts and, uh, excuse me, between human hosts and uh, companion animals, for certain microbes, the answer is, well, it looks like there's a lot of transmission events. So for this, this um, uh, previous B, uh, B. vulgatus is a lot easier to say. <laughs> um, for B. vulgatus, um, if we look at the anpan generated lineage of B. vulgatus strains, there is significant sharing between blue lineages, or significant overlap, I should say, between blue lineages, which are human, yellow lineages, which are canines, and then these rarer transmission events um, in red, which are, are cats. So here, this represents a, a microbe which seems to be frequently transmitted between humans and dogs specifically. But on the other hand, there are other microbes that appear in, at the species level in, in all three hosts, but which seem to be lineage specific. So in, in this Blauschia, for example, there's a, a feline lineage, a canine lineage, and a human lineage, and there's essentially no evidence of sharing of the, the same strains of this microbe. And of course, this being biology, we can find anything at either extreme or examples in the middle, where bugs like Ruminococcus navis, which is of particular interest for involvement in GI inflammation, seem to be occasionally transmitted. So this is uh, a bug which was frequently found in uh, canine hosts for which we could find one historical uh, transmission event into a, a feline lineage. And if you zoom in, there are these infrequent, very isolated transmission events into human hosts, suggesting that this bug can be transmitted in, in a, a, an occasional manner. So similar to what you would think of as a rare zoonotic event for a, a true pathogen, but now we're seeing this for, for commensals as well. And what Anpan can do for us is quantify the degree of um, uniqueness of hosts versus sharing of hosts, um, all the way from bugs that are frequently, uh, strains that are frequently shared down to strains and lineages that are highly host specific. Um, so I'll wrap up there with a, a couple of quick advertisements, one for our Microbiome and Public Health Center generally, which I, I co-direct with Wendy. Um, the HCMPH provides sort of an umbrella at the school for a range of activities, collaborations, projects, and, and platforms um, that are generally available to the community. So if you're interested in anything there, please take a, a look at our website for that as well. Um, and one of the activities from the, the center that this group might be uh, interested in is our upcoming annual symposium, uh, which this year is themed on the microbiome and cancer and takes place in uh, mid-May. 
uh, uses a very similar format to the, the MVIF. We have a, an online presence in addition to an in-person event if you happen to be here in Boston. For either of those, feel free to, to register online at, at this URL. Um, and we're really grateful for the, the collection of speakers we have, and we're still accepting poster submissions, um, both for in-person and virtual poster presentations, and, and some of these will be selected for short talks as well. So I'll wrap up there. Many thanks again to all of the, the faces that you saw on the slides were either lab members who carried out this work, um, collaborators who worked with us on it, including Nicola and, and Wendy, as, as always. And I am looking forward to the conversation and taking questions here. Thanks, everyone.